Uh, this series presents uh, discussions that are intended to cool down but uh, intensify in, in, in intellectual rigor debates about current issues that are um, on the stage right now. And today's is, 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 uh, is, is a good start. Um, the killing of Heather Heyer by James Alex Fields this past summer in Charlottesville, Virginia, it significantly notched up the heat on a debate about an issue that's been simmering in this country for decades. What should we do about public commemorations and monuments involving the more troubling parts of our history? The Charlottesville tragedy took place in a demonstration protesting the planned removal of a statue of the Confederate War General Robert E. Lee. Here in Minnesota, we do not have public statues of uh, Confederate War Generals, um, but we do have public spaces named after proponents of slavery, as well as participants in the shameful treatment of the indigenous people in this area. This past summer saw the renaming of a Minneapolis public school named after Alexander Ramsey who served as the first governor of the Minnesota Territory, second governor of the state, U.S. Senator, Secretary of War. He also led the efforts to clear this state from its indigenous people, proclaiming that, quote, the Sioux Indians of Minnesota must be exterminated or driven forever beyond the borders of the state. Students of that middle school led a successful campaign to rename the school Justice Allen Page Middle School in honor of the state's first black Supreme Court justice and Minnesota Viking legend. And we have a beautiful lake just a couple of minutes from here, named after the ardent supporter of slavery, John Calhoun, who served as US Senator, Secretary of War, and Vice President. In a few weeks, the Hennepin County Board will be voting on returning this to this lake, its original Dakota name, Bede Maka Ska. The debates over all of these issues raise extremely complex questions, and as we saw in Charlottesville, can ignite dangerously passionate reactions. As we try to figure out personally how to think through these issues and search for ways to cool down the passion, I do not think we could hope for two better guides than our two speakers today. Dean Uhura Williams joined the University of St. Thomas this past summer as the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. He earned a bachelor's degree in political science and a master's degree from hist in history from the University of Scranton and a PhD in history from Howard University. His research fields include 20th century Af American history, African American history, the civil rights and black power movements, and the African diaspora. Among his publications are the book Black Politics, White Power, Civil Rights, Black Power, and Black Panthers in New Haven. And he's currently working on a book entitled Six Degrees of Segregation, Lynching, Capital Punishment, and Jim Crow Justice. Dean Williams also served as Chief Historian and Vice President for Public Outreach and Education at the Jackie Robinson Foundation in New York for a number of years and is the recipient of the Fairfield University Martin Luther King Jr. Vision Award given to individuals who demonstrate a commitment to the ideals and values of Dr. King. Dean Robert Vischer has served as Dean of the School of Law for four years now. He's earned a bachelor's degree in political science from the University of New Orleans and a JD from Harvard Law School. His scholarship explores the intersection of law, religion, and public policy. His scholarship includes the books Martin Luther King Jr. and the Morality of Legal Practice, Lessons in Love and Justice, and Conscience and the Common Good, Reclaiming the Space Between Person and State. He's been a strong public voice in matters of racial and social justice over the past few years publishing essays such as Black Lives Matter puts the Catholic vision of higher education to the test and opposing budget cuts and legal aid programs. He serves on the Legal Services Corporation Leaders Council and will soon be an inaugural recipient of the Minnesota Lawyer Diversity and Inclusion Award, recognizing his contributions to the advancement of diversity and inclusion in the practice of law. So we are in good hands and I'm going to turn um, this program over to them in a minute. Um, the uh, format for our programs here. We compress them into one hour and so we do follow a strict schedule. We will have first Dean Williams speaking and then and then Dean Vischer. Then they'll have a chance to have a little bit of exchange with each other and then we'll take questions from the audience. We would like you please to put your questions on the pieces of paper that will be handed out um, down the aisles by our students it, uh, um, as, we, as the program gets underway and pass them. And they'll be collected and given to me and then I'll pose the questions to our two speakers. So please join me in in welcoming our two speakers for today. Thank you. Um, I don't, we don't have a lot of time with you today, so what I wanted to do is just kind of frame this conversation a little bit by, by asking the question, how did we get here? And I, I know some of you will remember um, in 2015, there was that incident that took place uh, at the State House in Charlotte, North Carolina. And the question about whether the removal of Confederate flags was necessary in order to restore a sense of racial justice in the United States. The young woman at the center of that controversy, Bree Newsom, uh, 
actually scaled the flagpole, removed the Confederate flag, became a hero. But the problem was, did any substantive change follow from the removal, removal of that flag? The irony of that whole situation is that that flag itself sat over a Confederate monument. And part of the question was, if you took the flag down, but if the monument remained, had you really taken away uh, the underpinnings of the celebratory nature of the way that we think about the Confederacy in this country? It's interesting because it's an issue that goes or, or transcends the present and forces us to really interrogate our past. It's a very disturbing cartoon from 1863, and the cartoonist begs a question, which is, the man who won the elephant at the raffle, but the question is, what am I to do with the creature? Congratulations, Mr. Lincoln and Republican Party. You just freed four and a half million people who used to be slaves. Now what? Are you going to integrate them into the society on equal uh, footing? with everyone else? Are they gonna have the same political rights? Are they gonna have the same social rights? Are they gonna have the same economic opportunities? If you're not prepared to answer that question in a substantive way, you will introduce into the republic a source of chaos and disorder which will haunt it. And literally, our history since Reconstruction has been haunted by the specter of the third rail in American politics, race, and our inability to have substantive conversations about how to move beyond it partly because the symbols of white supremacy continue to linger over us. I say that to you because when we talk about this long shadow of slavery and how it impacts American democracy and um, our notion of justice, it forces us to also confront the idea or the concept of white supremacy. And I want to present that to you today in a somewhat cartoonish way. But I, I love this book by Jason Sokol. It's entitled, There Goes My Everything, White Southerners in the Age of Jim Crow. Sokol has a relatively simple thesis. It went something like this. You know, white Southerners went to bed in 1945 and the world looked one way. No black people playing baseball, no civil rights playing in the Democratic Party. And then they woke up and literally there goes my everything. Everything that I thought I knew about my place in society has come under assault by virtue of the fact that a large segment of the population which has been denied the right to vote, denied the opportunity to have access to places of public accommodation, denied the opportunity to simply exist free from violence, is now contesting for and demanding the right to be treated as equal citizens. There goes my everything moments are interesting because we can look at these in a, a number of contexts. After the Civil War, there goes my everything moment resulted in the birth of the first Ku Klux Klan. In the 1920s, there goes my everything moment uh, resulted in the birth of the second Ku Klux Klan. We can talk about the record of violence and intimidation, people standing out in front of courthouses, chasing, chasing young people from school, uh, schoolhouse doors that accompanied the civil rights movement in this country. And I would submit to you that today we're in the midst of another one of those there goes my everything moment. Oh my God, black president. Oh my God, we're post-racial. It's something that you find scholars and intellectuals rejecting. Some of us got a sense of this in a book by ta Coates, which he titled, Between the World and Me. If you know a lot about African American history, you would know that ta Coates is really involving himself in a longstanding dialogue with other black scholars and intellectuals who've confronted the same issue. The title of the book, Between the World and Me, is actually a play in the words of W.E.B. Du Bois' Souls and Black Folks, which was written in 1903. And it's Du Bois who argues that the problem of the 20th century will be the problem of the color line. I would submit to you that the problem of the 21st century appears to also be the problem of the color line. It's interesting because Du Bois wrote in 1903, between me and the other world, there's the play on words, there is an ever unasked question, unasked by some through feelings of delicacy, by others through the difficulty of rightly framing, all nevertheless flutter around it. They approach me in a half hesitant sort of way. I me curiously or compassionately, and then instead of saying directly, how does it feel to be a problem? It's interesting that part of the conversation around Confederate monuments should center on recognizing people like Frederick Douglass. In 1865, excuse me, excuse me, yeah, in 1865, Frederick Douglass was invited to address the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society, and they posed one simple question from, for him. What do black people want? You're gonna be emancipated, what is it that you want? What is it that you need in order to feel like you're gonna be fully integrated into the society? Douglas gave an answer which I submit to you is gonna foreshadow the next 100 years. First and foremost, Douglas says, do nothing with us. Ha ha. Your doing with us has already played mischief. Do nothing with us. And he gives kind of a 
social Darwinian explanation here, um, but he goes into this uh, part here. All I ask is give him a chance to stand on his own legs. Let him alone. If you see him on his way to school, let him alone. Don't disturb him. If you see him going to the dinner table at a hotel, let him go. If you see him going to the ballot box, let him alone. Douglas has just foreshadowed in 1865 the next 100 years of US history. And you know what flew after 1910 over many of those battles? Confederate flags and Confederate war memorials, which like sentinels, peppered the landscape of the South and reinforced the notion of white supremacy, legitimized a war that was prosecuted by secessionists whose whole intent was to destroy the Union because, as Alexander Stevens argued in his Cornerstone Address, their government was going to be based on the great social truth that, quote, the Negro was not, in, was not superior, was inferior to white people, and should remain in that condition. The interesting thing about Douglas is that we all know that no sooner is the ink dry on the 13th Amendment, no sooner is the opportunity, the optimism that's engendered by the Civil War um, and Reconstruction over, that you get the birth of Jim Crow, Jim Crow segregation. And you can look and, and see this parallel here, what I like to call the six degrees of segregation, her block in 1963, showing segregated housing, segregated schools, segregated public accommodation, segregated job opportunities. And the idea here, and remember, nothing be, can be accomplished by taking to the streets. It's a good thing that civil rights workers did not abide by that logic. It's a good thing that the NAACP and its allies, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and its allies, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and its allies didn't abide by that logic or no change would have come. And in some sense, we can see efforts to remove the Confederate flag in that vein. We don't want to fall into the problem of false equivalencies. And you see this a lot in some of the discourse. Uh, we're not attacking conservatives. We're not attacking Southern heritage. We're not talking about, we're talking about slaveholders. And we're talking about people who waged war against the United States government for the maintenance of a system that is anathema to our core democratic values. There is no in between. It doesn't mean that we need to take down all these, it doesn't need, mean that the statues need to be destroyed, but they need to be moved to spaces where people can have dialogue and discussion about their meaning. Let me give you one example and then I'm done. This is an image of Frederick Douglass that sits out, the New, uh, out in front of the New York Historical Society where I've lectured many, many, many times. Now, Donald Trump is from New York. One would assume, since Donald Trump has been in the space of the New York Historical Society many times, he's encountered that statue. And yet, in 2017, Black History Month, Donald Trump, the president, went to the National African American History Museum, and this is what he said. I'm very proud now that we have a museum of, on the National Mall where people can learn about Reverend King, so many other things. Frederick Douglass is an example of somebody who's done an amazing job and is being recognized more and more, more noticed. The problem is, the statues are great, but Trump didn't acknowledge or couldn't understand the significance of Frederick Douglass until he encountered him in a museum where there was, now I'm not going to comment on the fact that he thought he was still alive, but I am going to say <laughs> that it's not until he encountered that in a space where there's more than just the statue, there's an opportunity for interrogation and conversation and discussion. There's no two sides about it. Confederate statues have to come down. They are as I wrote in The Progressive in 2017, not harmless remembrances of an honorable war, but our deepest shame as a nation. They perpetuate an acceptance of the long, ugly history of racial oppression in spite of emancipation. They are symbols of hate, representative of an inglorious past built on the immoral underpinnings of racial slavery. It's time to remove these monuments and put them in spaces like museum that pre preserve the full story of slavery where they can foster honest and frank conversations. Maintaining an idealized representation of the past does nothing to lift up the values at the core of our democracy. Thank you. So for my own contribution to this dialogue, I'd like to offer a concept that I'm referring to as reasoned empathy. Uh, Mayor Mitch Landrieu of New Orleans gave a beautiful speech a few months ago explaining his decision to remove, mo remove the monuments in New Orleans. So I'm just going to read a very brief portion of this. He said, a friend asked me to consider these four monuments from the perspective of an African-American mother or father trying to explain to their fifth grade daughter who Robert E. Lee is and why he stands atop our beautiful city. Can you do it? 
Can you look into that young girl's eyes and convince her that Robert E. Lee is there to encourage her? Do you think she will feel inspired and hopeful by that story? Do these monuments help her see a future with limitless potential? Have you ever thought that if her potential is limited, yours and mine are too? We all know the answer to these very simple questions. When you look into this child's eyes is the moment when the searing truth comes into focus for us. This is the moment when we know what is right and what we must do. We can't walk away from this truth. This passage reminds me of one of the famous uh, excerpts from Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail where he's writing about the, the painful conversation he had with his daughter when she's asking him why she can't attend the local amusement park, Fun Town. And that, that passage, its brilliance is that whatever the reader's race, the reader can relate as a parent to that pain. So in the debate about the Confederate monuments, we're not simply dealing with a series of intellectual propositions. We are encountering real pain, reasoned empathy. We need more than pure reason. We need to will ourselves to inhabit another person's story, embrace the vulnerability that permits us to see the world not in the way that keeps me in my comfortable and coherent narrative, but in a way that helps me build cross-cultural understanding even if it disrupts my own narrative. Civil friendship, which is a concept from Catholic social teaching that reminds us that our society's health depends much more on citizens' attitudes toward each other than any election results, requires long, difficult, and sometimes imaginative work to permit your story to shape my story. But it's work that's never been more important than it is today. So while we need more than pure reason, we do need reason. I'm not espousing some sort of postmodern take on empathy. Uh, where we each take turns explaining our own subjective interpretations of reality and then say, well, I feel your pain, but my truth is just as valid as your truth, so we'll just keep on keeping on in our parallel worlds. That sort of I'm okay, you're okay world may seem attractive on the surface, but it's toxic for civil discourse and ultimately dangerous for society. If every interpretation of a contested social symbol is equally valid, there's really nothing to talk about. We still have to settle the contest, of course, and we'll do it through raw power. That's not a recipe for social cohesion, robust pluralism, or civil friendship. Our capacity for conversations that do real work has been diminished on several fronts, including but not limited to our newfound tendency to express our most passionately held views in 140 characters or less. On some college campuses today, my strong emotional reaction to your words does not even let me tolerate your words, much less engage them. And cable news grabs viewers through guests who shout past each other, not even pretending to do the heavy lifting of real disagreement. When it comes to Confederate monuments, we need to exercise reason. The history of the monuments matters. The, de the dedication speeches matter. The reason why monuments were not erected immediately after the war then came in a deluge years after matters. The location in a town center rather than a cemetery matters. And reason helps us avoid the slippery slope pointed to by opponents of removal. Reason provides limiting principles. Reasoned empathy. I will listen to you, but facts matter. Fitzhugh Brundage, a history professor at University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, details how at the 1913 dedication of an on-campus monument honoring UNC students who fought for the Confederacy, the featured speaker, a white industrialist named Julian Carr, who was a big funder, unambiguously urged his audience to devote themselves to the maintenance of white supremacy with the same vigor that their Confederate ancestors had defended slavery. He praised Confederate soldiers for the defense of, quote, the Anglo-Saxon race during the four years after the war when their courage and steadfastness saved the very life of the Anglo-Saxon race in the South. This reference to four years after the war was clearly uh, to the rise of the Ku Klux Klan when they came about to terrorize blacks looking to claim their newfound freedom. In the same speech at that ceremony, Carr bragged about in the past, having horsewhipped, quote, a Negro wench until her skirt hung in shreds because she had disrespected a Southern lady. When a black student on the UNC campus today says that this statue sends a message of exclusion and marginalization as though they are not welcome as equal participants in the UNC community, that student is accurately perceiving the intent of those who erected the statue. To respond with, well, I respect your own personal interpretation of the statue, but in my view, it's just commemorating a chapter from our history, is not taking history or reason seriously. 
At the same time, calls to take down monuments to George Washington or Thomas Jefferson bear little relationship with calls to take down a statue like the one found on the UNC campus. Jefferson's role in our nation's founding has prompted countless memorials. I'm not aware of any erected to honor his status as a slaveholder or his treatment of Sally Hemings. The legacy of Thomas Jefferson is not without complication or pain, but to interpret efforts by the American political community to honor Jefferson as intending to exclude or marginalize blacks is also not taking history or reason seriously. Now one very tentative misgiving I have about removal. Empathy requires reminders that my lived reality is not the only lived reality. Historical markers or memorials can serve as these reminders. If our choice is between keeping Confederate statues and ridding our public space of all reminders of our society's racist history, I would opt for keeping the statues. We cannot let the removal of the statues contribute to the myth that we have finally arrived as a society that has transcended race. The election of President Obama led some to say, okay, we did it, you're not allowed to complain about racial injustice anymore. There may be a temptation to do the same in this case. If we don't have to see or talk about the statue in the town square that's a product of American racism, we no longer have to grapple with the ongoing legacy of racism. Americans are really good at avoiding unpleasant aspects of our history. Will removal of these statues facilitate further avoidance? The history offered by museums confronts only those who choose to be confronted. How do we bring history? even the painful parts of our history, into our everyday reality so that we can't avoid knowing. Finally, a word about process. If reasoned empathy is our goal, process matters. The process is itself an act of remembrance. The city of New Orleans did it really well, in my opinion. Public hearings, multiple committees, it was long, transparent, and grueling. Removing statues under cover of darkness, either individuals toppling them as an act of defiance or a city taking them down in a way that avoids public protest, is not conducive to reasoned empathy because it's an exercise of raw power, not of shared remembrance. Life in a pluralist democracy will be messy. Opponents of removal will win some and they'll lose some. But the debate itself makes us all face a truth that we may prefer to avoid and to encounter a lived reality that may not be our own. There is value in that, even if the statue doesn't come down. Thanks. I can say first and foremost, I agree. Um, I think it's interesting that when Dean Vischer talked about the concept of shared em empathy, he hits on something I think that's very important, at least in terms of understanding where, how people of color feel about these statues. And it's the idea that wounds produce narratives and that our reaction to symbols like Confederate flags and like Confederate monuments come from the wound itself. The fact that these monuments, these markers, these memorials are ultimately a testimony to people who engaged in behaviors that at their core were about the denial of equal rights for people of color in this country. Having said that, one of the places that I think Dean Vischer and I agree is on the question of markers themselves. There's certainly space for markers and memorials on battlefields. Places where things happened certainly should be uh, spaces where we can talk about, where we can commemorate, where we can remember. And that invitation to do so seems appropriate. The public square, however, is a big problem for me. Because having a Calhoun Lake or a Calhoun College, even if he was a alum of Yale University, is an affirmation that somehow his values are your values. And that those values continue, in some sense, to inform the way that an institution or a people or a township defines itself. I find that problematic partly because, and I think this is interesting when we think about final thoughts, that there's a clear through line between this history, Jim Crow, and this history where we are today. And while I don't support and I'm uncomfortable with the idea of vandalizing public spaces, while I agree with Dean Vischer that process is important, 
it's almost like a truth and reconciliation commission where we have an opportunity to revisit that history and in some sense, as you uh, correctly note, force people to grapple with who won't go to the museum otherwise, that history. It's also important to note, as the Supreme Court did in the case Trott versus Dulles, uh, Chief Justice Warren, trying to define the Eighth Amendment, argued that it drew its meaning from the evolving standards of decency that mark the progress of a maturing society. We don't draw on quarter people anymore. And I think it's high time that we stopped celebrating and commemorating and memorializing those who fought to deny freedom to others. It's inconsistent with our values at present. And one could argue that in so doing, what we do is affirm for those who want to go back that those values have changed and we won't go with them. Thanks. So I also will start by saying I agree, <laughs> which is not, doesn't make for fireworks, but uh, maybe they'll come later. Um, I, I think there is more to explore this na nature of the public spaces and what is the role for shared remembrance in public spaces even when it's painful remembrances. I mean, the, you know, this summer uh, I got the privilege of going to the National uh, African American History Museum in DC and I also couldn't help but notice how much higher the percentage of uh, African-American patrons in that museum were compared to all the other museums on the mall, right? You can choose to be confronted with the things you want to be confronted with or not. I think that's a real problem with the public space. And I'll bring it back to something Professor Schultz said in the opening about the renaming of Ramsey School in South Minneapolis. That's the school my kids go to or have gone to and uh, had two there last year. And they were involved in this renaming process. Uh, and I eventually came around to understanding and supporting but right at the right at the beginning I think one of my kids came home and said hey we're gonna we're gonna rename the school and the kids voted and the number one name getter was Prince it's gonna be the Prince <laughs> school I'm like what <laughs> let's talk some more about this and uh, and it was it was a really good process for them I think my fear at the front end was it can be Ease, unless we're willing to go deep, it can be willing to, it can be easy to just cut off that history in what ends up being a superficial act and saying, look, now it's all fine. Everybody loves Prince, right? We all love Prince. Here we go. Everything's fine. Um, and I think the selection of Justice Page was, was awesome. And I think it's a, it, he's, a, he's a worthy model for folks to emulate. And, and Prince, maybe I would have come around on Prince eventually. <laughs> um, but what was important is that they, it wasn't an easy fix. They made it go more than a year in the process. They made them do the work. They made them do the history. What I uh, hope that they still can do and what we can do in all these conversations is uh, find the impetus for the hard conversations, especially for those segments of our society that don't carry that pain directly even when the visible reminder is put off into a museum somewhere. Do you questions? have anything more you want to say, or should we start with some questions? Let's do, take some questions. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. I'll begin with a, I'll begin with a um, one question first for Dean Williams, and then one for uh, Dean Vischer. It seemed to me as though um, you quite emphatically say the statutes have to come down. And, and, and Dean Vischer, you said that um, we need a process. And the end result of that process may sometimes be the statutes don't come down. Can you conceive of any justifiable circumstances that, that the statutes would not come down after such a deliberation that would be healthy for this, this country, do you think, Dean Williams? I, I think there are a couple. I think one of them is, um, we preserve, we have all kinds of, of laws around historic preservation. If you could point to something historically significant about the statue or the history that surrounded it, I think there's room for interpretation around that. So preserving that, for example, the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Now, Edmund Pettus was a Confederate war general, and that bridge is significant because that was the bridge that the March to Freedom took place on in 1965. The fact that it's called the Edmund Pettus Bridge is significant. I would not change the name of that bridge. 
the symbolism of that 1965 moment is almost dependent on the historical name of that bridge and what it represents in terms of what happened in that space in 1965 and whom it's named after. So I think there are opportunities for that. But I also think, and it's interesting that, that uh, uh, Rob raised this, uh, John Hope Franklin and Abraham Eisenstadt write in uh, the edition of Every American History series that every generation writes its own history for it tends to see the past in the foreshortened perspective of its own historical moment. If we were invited on, at every occasion to kind of revisit the names of things, number one, our GPSs would go crazy because we wouldn't know where to go. But more importantly, I do think there's value in a society taking a step back. In New Jersey, the rest stops on the New Jersey Turnpike are named for historically relevant people. And they have people like um, Claire Barton and, and uh, Richard Stockton, so on and so forth. What I like about it is, though, that I can always ask my, I used to ask my students all the time, if you were to add a rest stop, who would you name it after and why? And that's an interesting conversation because it's a barometer at any given moment about where a society is, what it values, who it values, what it thinks is important. I think regular touches in that way are very healthy for society in evaluating its history and its evolving values and culture. Thank you. Do you have any comments to that, Bob? I agree. OK. <laughs> the best comment. The question that I have for you based on, on these initial uh, um, conversations was um, you talk about the deliberative process being so important. But I, I'm, I'm reminded of um, something that was mentioned in your article in Progressive, uh, that the, the tearing down of the statutes of Saddam Hussein and the, um, and the, and the public um, catharsis in Eastern Europe with the toppling of statutes of Lenin and Stalin when their democratic governments took over. Is there no place in your, in, in your scheme for a public catharsis of destruction of something that's such a symbol of hatred? Well, it's sort of just by nature and by background, I'm the person, whenever I see a street protest, my instinct is to make a sign that says, it's more complicated than you think. <laughs> so I don't know if I'm the, if I'm the catharsis type guy. Uh, uh, there could be, but I would say, just from the Iraq example, I don't know if that served us well. I mean, the catharsis was, you know, eliminating everybody from Saddam's bath party, from all, you know, government leadership positions and tearing down everything. I, I think in the end that didn't, that didn't go very well. Um, I would say having the process of, which they've done in, in uh, South Africa and some other countries, this shared process of remembrance makes it what I would hope, and maybe this is naive and optimistic, the, cathar the catharsis comes through the remembrance and bringing other people uh, who have not been part of that core experience of pain, but making them part of that process of remembrance can itself be cathartic in ways that are more sustainable and long lasting than just sneaking under the cover of night and sledgehammering a statue. Now, it might be naive because there has to be willing participants for that process of remembrance. I, I get that. And so how we facilitate that is a different, is a different question. Well, that's ex exactly the question that um, one of our, one of our uh, audience members poses. You discussed how, for both of you, you discussed how monuments kind of be taken down in the dead of night, but need to induce public conversation. If that conversation were to end with a decision not to take the monuments down, then what's the next step? It's more complicated. Um, I, <laughs> I just wrote a, a piece for uh, April 4th, 2018, will be the 50th anniversary of the assassination of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. In September of 1967, he was invited to address the American Psychological Association. And in that address, he talked about this process called creative um, maladjustment being comfortable with chaos and disorder in a way that invites us to reflect on civil disobedience as a means of rectifying those things that can't be, uh, that you can't move through normal processes. There's something to be said for taking a knee or striking out at a statue in the dead of night because it keeps conversations that would otherwise die going. And for that reason, there is constructive importance to being able to engage in those types of acts of civil disobedience. 
the America that we live in today is a product of civil disobedience going back to not only the civil rights movement, but the women's movement. And for Hillary Clinton to be able to say, as she did in 2008, that the glass ceiling had a, uh, you know, it was cracked and had a million pieces, but we still haven't worked through the shards of glass that continue to rain on us uh, with regard to gender equality in this country. Um, we talk about, as, as Rob pointed out, all the gains that we made in terms of a Civil Rights Act and a Voting Rights Act, and yet we still are dealing with and living in a society where people forget this whole conversation about Confederate monuments began with the unprecedented number of killing of black and brown people in American streets by law enforcement officers in the South who often wore Confederate flags stitched into their uniforms on the back of their police cruisers. So I agree with Rob, it is much more difficult, but I do think that there is room for, you know, Heather Hires, how many, how much more blood will be spilt at the base of these monuments in brass and in stone to people who actually were willing to spill blood in order to maintain separate but equal in order to maintain um, inequality. I happen to believe that it is necessary and sometimes justifiable to, justifiable to engage in that type of behavior. Thank you. Um, one of our questioners asks both of you, is it problematic that there is such a sensitivity to everything, even remotely touching on racial issues, especially since racial problems are a part of our history, as it is with every country? And the difficulty is who decides what's offensive? So uh, I'm not, I, don't, I don't think there's been an oversensitivity to racial issues. There might, in many cases, there's an undersensitivity to racial issues in this sense that um, there might be some racial issues on the surface that attract the attention, but the deep structural uh, inequality doesn't get a lot of attention. So if you, you know, read a book like uh, the New Jim Crow or some of these other books that really document some of these disparities. I don't think we've been overly sensitive to that. I don't think we've been sensitive to, to those at all, speaking particularly for uh, uh, folks who are not people of color who've been affected directly by it. Um, there's another component of this, and that is uh, in terms of sensitivity and how we manage our conflict over things that are offensive. Um, not just seem offensive, but are offensive. Uh, and that is, and this goes beyond the race issue, how do we as a, as a society with lots of different views and opinions that, that warrants freedom, um, how do we navigate the tensions that arise from dignitary harms, okay, as opposed to sort of tangible harms or, so it's different when, you know, it's, it's easy to look to the dismantling of Jim Crow in the South as a great example for how the law can intervene and make change happen because you had an entire society that was hardwired for the subjugation and exclusion of blacks, you know, from, from goods and services that are fundamental to participation in our society. I'll take it out of the race question for a minute, but we're dealing with this at, a, at, a, at another level. If, if uh, a gay couple goes into a baker and is denied a cake for their wedding ceremony, if there are lots of other bakers in town who are more than happy to take their money and bake the cake, what do we do with that, right? That's more of a dignitary harm than this tangible harm that we saw in Jim Crow. Doesn't mean it's not harm, not at all. I think it means, my view, in a society that takes pluralism seriously, we have to be very careful about intervening too strongly to try to take away any p possibility for someone to suffer dignitary harm, right? So in this case, the ongoing pain that would absolutely accompany a community's decision not to take down a statue, that's different in my view than when you have a town's schools and hotels and restaurants and every place of public accommodation shut off to someone because of the color of their skin. Doesn't make the resolution easy, but it's different. Hmm. Uh, I'm glad we're having this conversation at the law school because that's a, <laughs> that's a tough question, but it's a question that is not new in terms of our history. We can go back to the civil rights cases of 1883 where the Supreme Court was forced to adjudicate on the question of state sanctioned segregation as opposed to segregation that's practiced by private individuals. If I own a business and I choose to discriminate against someone, what um, measure, what 
uh, mechanism does the state have to compel me to behave? I agree with Rob in this sense because I had heart surgery a couple of years ago, and I remember as I was going in, my doctor said, we're going to give you this, I, I forgot what it was called, barium or something. We're going to let you drink it, and that will point out to us the areas where your heart is distressed. It was nasty, but I'm very glad that they <laughs> had it because without that concoction, they wouldn't have been able to identify the places where they needed to intervene. I sometimes think in these conversations that when we get situations like what occurred in Arizona, where you have a, a wedding uh, baker saying, we're not going to serve lesbian, gay, transgender people in our establishment. It's the barium in our society that says, this is where we need to do the hard work in our learnings, in our centers of learning. This is where we need to do the hard work in our churches and civic centers. This is where we need to do the hard work in our society as a whole to help overcome those barriers to human understanding. It is part of our, our human enterprise to want to move toward a society where we value people, not in the um, soundbite Martin Luther King content of our character as opposed to the color of our skin, but really to truly value people and recognize that this is not healthy in a pluralistic society, and it's certainly not healthy for our democracy. So in that sense, I think the interesting thing about this, and I agree with Rob, the social, the, the political must be eradicated without question. But the um, social injuries, the personal injuries, sometimes can be, be very helpful in helping us recognize how far we need to go and where we need to go. And there are a thousand examples of that that we could point to that, that point to the importance of those moments. So another question um, for Dean Vischer, isn't it a slippery slope to hold on to knowingly wrong monuments simply for the sake of remembrance? Where does it end? Should we have kept the Berlin Wall intact? And how do we get the blissfully ignorant to understand the issues if they're actively promoting the wrongness of the monuments? So it's, I think it's another question about the process. What, how do we make? Yeah, so part of my answer is, is that's, uh, and I'm saying this with knowledge of the full weight historically in the civil rights context, but part of that is the messiness of democracy, right? Now the question becomes, when does the democratic outcome go so far beyond what is tolerable in the society that we value in terms of uh, human rights and avoiding the tyranny of the majority that we're going to intervene to short circuit that democratic process? And I'm certainly open to input on why a particular memorial should or shouldn't fall on one side of the line, but I don't think that the default position should be the monuments that we know are wrong come down by hook or by crook, by any means necessary. I think that is, over the long term, uh, corrosive to the rule of law because I see the slippery slope is pushing in that direction too, not just in the direction of, oh, how many monuments are we going to keep up? Because uh, there's still that substantive conversation to be had at the, I would say, at the local level, knowing that at the local level has not always worked well in the context of race in the United States. Okay. So this is maybe the opposite side of that question. We've been sort of, people have been asking, how do we, how do we reach the people, how do, how do we reach people's wrong decisions um, that, we, that we judge to be wrong? Um, so this is one that's is posted to Dean Williams. Um, the Obama presidency, and there goes my everything, what do you make of a 2012 Gallup poll that found that 96% of respondents would vote for a black presidential candidate, candidate nominated by their party if they found that candidate qualified? This number has increased every year since Gallup began asking the question in 1937. Is the poll non-representative of white Southerners in your view? Well, white, white Southerners, there's a great um, story about the Obama election about him going to rural Pennsylvania, which uh, Go uh, Governor L. Rin Ed Rendell once responded uh, or called, you know, um, Alabama surrounded by Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, which is kind of funny. But there's this great story about them going to talk to this uh, person in Pennsylvania who was from one of these kind of uh, rural spaces, one of these um, places, and they asked who he was going to vote for, and the person said, we're going to vote for the N-word. Now, let's be clear. People can recognize and vote for people who they believe are acting in their interest, even if they hold racial animosity toward that person. It certainly is a sign of progress that the United States was in a position to elect 
an African American to the highest position in the country. But then we have to be very frank and honest about the way that he was treated and the disrespect that attended his occupation of that office throughout the eight years that he was there. And I also point out he was reelected uh, by healthy, um, healthy number. So the Obama presidency is an interesting moment in our history that forces us to contend with, again, the paradox of American slavery and American freedom and the uh, problems of race as we understand them in this country, whereby, for example, you can have someone like Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz who identify as Latino, not necessarily identify with what we would consider to be those people who live in cities, Latino issues that are black and brown issues. I mean, this is the complexity of it. You can have someone like Obama, who some people loved and think was a phenomenal president, pursue policies in terms of public education, which were as corrosive as uh, those that we saw uh, by uh, those that you would have associated those policies with. I mean, mm -hmm. this is the problem of, you know, the, the, it's, it's more complex that Rob talked about. I guess I would end by saying that we can't use polling as an accurate measure of where we are in terms of our uh, racial understanding because Sunday morning is still the most segregated hour um, in America. Where people go to church, how people worship, what they do for leisure, um, those are all important. The fact that we're having a national conversation about sports teams and players who are kneeling to audiences that are predominantly white, and, and let's be clear, we haven't even begun to scratch the issue of poverty in this, in this conversation. Mm -hmm. Reverend Dr. King put it best. Um, you know, what good is it to have the right to eat in a restaurant if you can't afford anything on the menu? When you have all black players kneeling because of the wound that's crying out in American cities because of black and brown bodies that find themselves victims of police violence, and they're playing to an all-white audience and all-white owners and who sit in boxes that the vast majority of people can't afford, and most people can't even afford to go to a game, there's kind of a deeper context to this that gets beyond just having a black president. Can I wait on that a minute? I do, I do think the, the monuments uh, give an insight into where we are in race relations, because I do believe that the overwhelming majority of Americans would be willing to vote for a black president. I think that the percentage of American, uh, white Americans who would be you know, willing to have a black friend or a black family over for dinner, that's increased remarkably over the last 50 years. But what hasn't changed nearly as much is the willingness to go deeper into seeing how racism has affected structural inequality. So even if, I mean, there, Tons of examples. Even if you look at the Twin Cities, in 1948, nearly half of the housing develop the new housing developments in the Twin Cities were had racial covenants that attached to those developments, and so you had the African American population uh, legally frozen out of those developments. At the same time, the Federal Housing Authority would not uh, insure the mortgages to uh, housing developments in the high risk areas of the city, which were mostly the black areas of the city, so you had black families really uh, excluded from the housing market during the biggest housing boom in history, the post-World War II housing boom, which for most Americans on average provides about two-thirds of family wealth, is the equity you have in your house. So there's no surprise that today, even though African American households earn I think about 60-65% of the average white uh, income the household wealth is about 10% of the average white household wealth. Now, to me, those are the conversations that have to happen, but our response, white America's response too often is, we're fine, I've got a few black friends that I'd be willing to have to my house for dinner, and when it comes to that monument, can you just let it go? Can you just get over it? I mean, we're, we're so past this, right? So it's, I, I agree, with, I believe that survey data, but it's, it doesn't reflect where we really are. So there's a follow-up coming to that very question, really, asking, asking both of you to, to answer a little bit more concretely than what do we do here? Minnesota was recently ranked second worst in the country for African Americans, citing gross disparity, median incomes, home ownership rates, and educational attainment. How do you suggest Minnesotans engage our own history of racial inequality absent monuments or memorials? How does the responsibility of the, what is the responsibility of states with de facto segregation, how does the responsibility of states with de facto segregation differ from de jure segregation? 
St. Paul has a uh, memorial to Roy Wilkins, who was born uh, here. And the NAACP in the 1960s, the late 1960s, as they were trying to, to chart a new course for how to combat uh, segregation post-Civil Rights Act and Voting Rights Act, really focused on de facto segregation. They sent a woman named June Shagalov Alexander throughout the North and West to identify pockets of uh, racial inequality and to figure out a strategy for toppling de facto segregation, which is a, a much more difficult thing to unsettle because it's easy to look at the law and to say, change this law. It's much more difficult to get at those inequalities that are rooted, as Rob talked about, in, in things that are less tangible. The reason I, I, I mention that is because there is a monument to Roy Wilkins there that doesn't include a statue. That's an interesting talking point, because in the design, which both uh, Victoria and I, um, if you don't know my colleague uh, from St. Paul campus, brilliant um, art historian, who took me on a tour of that space, um, even though we'd, I don't necessarily appreciate the design, I appreciate what it represents because it, it, in its representation, forces you to confront the deep-seated inequality that wasn't only uh, present in the Deep South, but also in the urban North and in the West. The NAACP's mission extended beyond dealing with Jim Crow segregation in the heart of the Confederacy. And what they encountered in Chicago was a mayor in Richard Daley who had a democratic machine to back them, which at its core was a racist machine. You can talk about, um, here in Minnesota, the same problems. And I think part of the reason that this is important is the monuments can't do the work of the schools. The monuments can't do the work of community and civic organizations. The monuments can't do the work of parents and teachers. It just can't do that work. That work has to be done by us in spaces like this, taking advantage of opportunities to foster a deeper, deeper dialogue. I also think, and this is part and parcel of the, the larger issue here in terms of history, and I did this with the slide about false equivalencies. I'm a little disturbed by the narrative now that says, well, when you saw Glenn Beck a few years ago talk about, you know, we have to reclaim the legacy of the civil rights movement, I'm thinking to myself, what in the heck is Glenn Beck talking about? Um, it's an honest appraisal of that history and an opportunity really to take a deep look at and interrogate ourselves and our democracy from the standpoint that we also have to recognize, and I did foundation work in New York with the Jackie Robinson Foundation, so I recognize this. Everybody wants to give money to the poor until that moment when they assume that those people are competing with them. Sure, the colored should have nice houses as long as they don't live next door to me. I mean, that's the real issue. We don't see ourselves as being united in the sense that all boats rise when we tackle issues of inequality. Uh, in the whole Black Lives Matter conversation now, there's some fragmentation in the movement around how we deal with violence against black people who are also queer. Because it's easy to rally around um, someone like uh, Tamir Rice, right? Or, or, but when you're talking about homophobia, which extends beyond communities and has no, you know, it's a, black people aren't better, better on homophobia than white people or Latinos. Then you're talking about, and I can use this language because we're at an institution inspired by the Catholic intellectual tradition, the least of my brothers. And until you get it right with the least, you ain't going to get it right with the most. Uh, so I'll add just briefly to that. Uh, I don't have easy solutions. I don't think there are easy solutions. I view my role as trying to promote opportunities for greater understanding. So uh, many of you will remember, this is a couple years back now when, uh, you know, multiple protests, but one protest particularly on a rainy night that uh, shut down I-94 that was led by our former colleague here, Nakima Levy Pounds. And since I was the dean, I, I heard a lot from members of the public who were wondering why she wasn't fired immediately and all these other things. And I didn't have, uh, I didn't have any special insight to offer except the question, how desperate would you have to feel to take your kids and walk out onto the middle of I-94 in the rain at night? Now let's try to understand where that desperation comes from. And not not with an eye toward, let me hear about the desperation so then I can figure out how to solve it, but just to let that wash over me to really deepen my understanding, to facilitate the understanding uh, by others. And that's part of the, with the monuments is, you know, not just, well, why is it such a big deal? But help me understand why this is so painful. And maybe that then goes 
X, Y, Z direct action? Maybe not, I don't know, but we can't get to that point of action unless we're willing to put in the time to really build some relationships and understanding and listening. Thank you. Dean Williams, do you have any last words that you'd like to offer as we get close to the witching hour in which we have to release this room? Uh, I think uh, just that, you know, I think the subtitle of Rob's book, uh, Lessons in Love and Justice, is guiding blueprint for all of us. Because there is this sense that there's a tension between the two, and there doesn't necessarily have to be. Uh, if we look to the struggles in the past that have helped to deepen our democracy, they've all been rooted in an expansion of our core democratic values that privilege our humanity, that seek connectivity in that humanness that really should inspire us to want to work towards solutions that have the greatest benefit for the largest number of people. It's the reason I love that book by Rob, but I also do think that there's practical value in taking the time to assess the meaning of those words and to, to really dig deep and do the hard work of confronting whether we really want love and justice or if we just want to be comfortable. And they're very different conversations. Um, I'm going to ask you in a minute to join me in, in thanking our two brilliant speakers. Um, and, but I think that what we've seen now is something that's reflected in the difficulty I had in sorting through the questions. There's a whole layer of questions about the specifics of the decisions of the, of the Confederate monuments. Um, we've teased out some of the complexities of even answering that question. Um, um, but the conversation quickly went into the much deeper questions and the much broader conversation that this particular instance of confronting our past uh, really brings to light. And um, we got a little taste of that, too. We can't get much more than a taste in the hour that we have, but we can continue these conversations among ourselves and hopefully have some follow-ups. And if you like this and want more of this, we're going to be doing the same program in the St. Paul campus tom tomorrow over the noon hour. You can um, come and join them, too. Um, remember, our next um, event is going to be on October 17th. It's going to be discussing another equally contentious issue, the issue of welfare reform and block grants. We're going to have one of our alumni from the University of St. Thomas School of Law, who's now policy director for uh, Catholic Charities USA speak, and a professor of finance from um, across the, the way. So please come to that, and please join me in welcoming our two brilliant speakers. Okay. Thank you.